Year after year after year, I hear people tell me that they do not want to pay large subscription fees or for memberships to be able to get access to content related to safety. So me and my friends here at Safety FM have come up with an idea called Safety FM Plus. This is a video streaming service that allows you to have some downloadable document content available readily wherever you are. You can go to the website safetyfmplus.com or go to the Apple Store app and download it for your iPhone, iPad, or even Apple TV. It's also available on Android and Android TV, Roku, and Fire TV. We want to be wherever you are. So to get you started, you can come to the website or download the apps as we just discussed. The other great portion about this is that if you sign up right now at safetyfmplus.com, you will get a downloadable version of Simple Revolutionary Acts, the first book by Dr. Todd Conklin as part of your membership to get into this. So go right now to safetyfmplus.com to find out more information. That is safetyfmplus.com. This, 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 this show is brought to you by Safety FM. Well, hello and welcome to the Jay Allen Show. So hopefully everything is good and grand inside of your neck of the woods. So let me tell you what we have planned for today. Today, I get to have the lovely opportunity of having a conversation with Danielle Dow. During our conversation, she's going to tell us a little bit about her career, how she got involved with safety, and something that has occurred that changed her life forever. Let's not hold up for too long. Let's get this conversation started with Danielle Dow right here on The Jay Allen Show. The Jay Allen Show is streaming now on safetyfm.live. Let's start off with the simplest question of them all. The most difficult and the simplest. How did you get involved inside of this world of safety? Because I think that that's always the most interesting aspect on when we first start off, because most people don't start off because this is what they're looking to. So how did you get into it? Yeah, great. Um, So I definitely didn't even know that safety was a career when I was in college and undergrad. I was in the health sciences kind of world pre-med. I was at UCF. I was like gung-ho, I'm going to be a doctor. And then a lot of things happened during that year, I age myself, but I decided that wasn't for me. So I volunteered at the hospital, did a lot of things like that. I'm like, uh, not for me, but I was already three years into the program. So let's go ahead and finish it. So during my last year, I started applying for internships anywhere, anything. Like I was like, I just need to get a career. I had student loans. I'm like, all right, we got to do this. So I ended up um, applying for an internship at my current employer. And the only reason I did is because I had the word health and safety in it. I had no idea what it was. So you thought it it was health related because it said health. (laughs) I think I even like in the interview, I kind of describe myself as like, oh, I'm really good at microbiology and, and bloodborne mm-hmm. pathogens and such like that. And I'm like, yeah, that's great. Oh, for sure. And so anyways, the only reason I got hired was because whomever was fitted for that role, the week of, they decided to back out. So they rummaged according to the person who hired me. They rummaged through the resumes and said, oh, this person's from Central Florida. And that's where my current player is. And they, they're like, hey, um, you know, not can you fog a mirror, but like, can you, can, can you get to work on Monday? Like, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of career aspirations there. Can you make it to where we're, where yeah. we're at? Yeah, they're like, okay, well, there's some orientation this uh, Saturday. Can can you show up? Yeah, sure, okay. And I had no idea what I was doing. I just remember doing cartwheels where I was like, oh, I have a job. I was so excited. And it was pretty well paying for for what I was doing. I was working retail. Like, American Eagle or Macy's or something. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, no, so that was the start of it. And I just never looked back. So how long ago are we talking on this actually taking place? I'm not asking to age yourself, of course. This is just a general question. No, no, no. no. Hey, so I'm 33 now and I was 20 something whatever when I graduated. So that was about 12 years ago. Okay. And yeah. Yeah, so it was well, well, I mean, that's a, that's a long career trajectory. I mean, being at the same place for that long a period of time. I know. 
So, yeah. did, so the position did it evolve, or how did it how did it go about? Oh, I see what you mean. Okay, mm. yeah. So I started as an intern. I worked for the industrial hygiene department, and basically, I wasn't a pump jockey, but I would go and I'd hang dosimeters on folks and and I got to work some weird hours. But it came with a lot of cool benefits too, because I got to see a lot of behind the scenes kind of stuff where I mm. work. So that was pretty interesting. And then I fell in love with that side, that more sciencey side, and then a contract position opened up in the field at the end of my year-long internship and I got the job oh my gosh and I just again yeah, never looked back so and then from there it just kept evolving and then I went to construction and I went and I supported operations and then food and beverage and then anything under the sun like it was just all over the place so although I've only worked one place for about 12 years I think I've worked almost everything i don't but, think but, there's nuclear there but uh, there is uh, more oil and gas but there is like gosh there's utilities there's everything mm-hmm. so i mean it's one of the larger employers for the area but let's talk about that for a moment because it's not quite exactly health that you were looking to so as you get into it how does this change for you how do you look at this and go this is not exactly what i wanted i mean to an extent when you first started off so how did the love come about oh i see what you mean yeah so I think I'm just in love with public health in general. So I think everybody, once I found out that this career kind of exists, I said, hey, everybody deserves to go home with their fingers and toes, all that kind of thing. But I also believe everybody desires or deserves to retire happy and healthy. If you're going to work 30, 40, whatever years at a, at a company, you deserve to go hang out with your grandchildren with a full set of lungs and all like that. So yeah, so it's just public health in general. And I think it's really important. And, you know, we rely on folks, frontline workers to do all sorts of things, trucking sort of stuff. And if I can help with that, that sounds good. So when you look back now, and you know that you started off your career with you wanted to do medical, it didn't quite end up that way. Uh, do you ever look back and go, I should have continued? Or how do you look at it? I mean, especially now that you've seen a little bit of everything, because as you are aware, this industry of safety is so different in regards of what you can do and accomplish and the different things you can get into. Yeah, yeah. So I've definitely kind of partnered up with the occupational doctors and nurses and such like that. So I got a little taste of that and how, um, you know, whatever, all the different types of tests that they, they do. I got to hang out with them quite a bit. So, but no, I'm really happy helping people the way I do. I think I get to see lots of different industries um, at school where I'm at right now, there are some occupational doctors that I am in my cohort and I help them understand like, Hey guys, no, these are the people who are, you know, you are going to be supporting the people who help you do your everyday life. And that helps America run and helps the world go around. So as you look at this and now you have these other cohorts <laughs> and let's be, if I can mention the university by name, yeah. now you're actually going to a university that's quite a few miles separate. I mean, let's, let's talk about over like 90 miles from where you originally went. Yeah. yeah. So, so how are so- <laughs> good traffic makes it a little easier. So yeah, so I'm from Orlando, Florida, and the school is the University of South Florida in Tampa. I have this amazing opportunity to, uh, there's a scholarship there, which I can go into detail later. I, I wish I knew about it earlier. But yeah, so there's a uh, Master's of Science in Public Health in Occupational Exposure Sciences, which is a fancy word for industrial hygiene. So, yeah. <laughs> I don't know why they just changed the name, so I just want to go there. But it's a great opportunity, and um, also within those cohorts, there's industrial hygienists, there's um, occupational safety folks, kind of like health and safety folks. And then there's occupational nurses and doctors, too, and just public health professionals who create policy and change and stuff like that. So it's a really interesting college to be into and happy to be there. So, so uh, is there a huge dynamic difference between being at the University of Central Florida and the University of South Florida? <laughs> no pressure well, there. No pressure. I, I do have a UCF plate on the back of my car and there's quite some rivalry. So when I park my car, I make sure that I put the UCF uh, plate away from this. But there's not a lot of folks on, on campus right now with COVID. So I only have to go to class once a week uh, for a laboratory that you physically have to touch and feel stuff. So that's why I'm in everything else is online. But yeah, there is a little bit of a change. So as you're doing this, you're now going after your master's, yeah. if, I, if I understood that correctly. So as you're doing this, what is the, what's the long-term goal? What are you wanting to accomplish now? Just again, public health. So, <laughs> I'm just excited uh-huh. about helping people. So uh, yes, industrial hygiene. I think that I um, had a pretty narrow focus when I first started. Now I'm, I'm, I'm just about a year into my program. Um, but what I didn't understand was the breadth of, of different things that I can help with. So I can even go into policy change. I can go into 
all sorts of interesting things. I still, at heart, am a nerd, and I really like chemistry and all that kind of stuff. So I probably like stay in the industrial hygiene field, but this definitely opens a lot. So. Well, and let's talk about some of those opportunities because let me talk about for a brief moment on how we originally met. I met you originally at the American Society of Safety Professionals, it might even been the engineers at the time um, in Central Florida, where you were the vice chair. Oh, God. So you were the vice chair. By, by default, I think. <laughs> I don't think I like voted on that. I think you just showed up like, hey, this is what's happening. So with all your free time, you were doing that as well. And then essentially you got moved to the president position or voted into the president position. Now, of, I know. Yeah. There's kind of a weird Long twist story. to the yeah. weird twist to that story, but also at the same time with the employer that you read at the time, you got promoted right close to the same timeline. I did. So you did not step into that position. And I think it's okay. So that's something I've learned now that if it was something I could tell myself in my early career, it's okay to say no. I think I did put some time and effort into it. And I think there was a where you know someone was able to backfill me. So it wasn't I don't think I was leaving you behind right now. Now <laughs> maybe that person who uh, backfilled me is a little upset with me, but I think she did a great job. And <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so um, that was a lot of fun, but it was okay to say no. I got an opportunity to go onto a construction site, and that was definitely a new bound for not just my resume, but you know, just learning about safety. You know, all of us was building roller coasters. So, mm-hmm. so as you so as you look at that for a moment, because some people really take a look at that that position of of, of the chair of being the president of a of an organization. Yeah, it's of course that's a thing. I know it's a yeah. huge thing. I mean, some people that's their whole goal in their career, oh, and, you, and you're able to walk away from it. How? How did the whole thought process come about? Because I would imagine there has to be some level of pressure at the same time, too, yes. in regards of, OK, I got this. I got a, it's, a, it's an elected position. So you get elected into it. And then all of a sudden you go, I want to focus on my career. Well, there's nothing wrong with it. So I just want to make sure that I'm clear. How did you go through the process of determining that you didn't have enough time? And I mean that in a good way, because that could yeah. probably come, come across so wrong at the same time, too. Yeah, no, no, no. So I definitely wanted to branch out in my career. Yes, that was a great opportunity and such like that. But I think that my, you know, speaking in front of a room full of people, perhaps I'm not the best, but maybe I'm a little bit better than construction safety. And that was definitely something that I wanted on my resume, that I wanted the experience. So I kind of weighed out what skills would I get from one versus the other. And I said, hey, construction, I need to get my butt in there. Now, I did it. I'm good. So (laughs) it was was hot. It was, you know, enriching a learning experience. I'll put it that way. But um, I'm pretty excited to go back into like just industrial hygiene, but those construction jobs where in, in my employer doesn't open up every day. So that was an opportunity for me to go there. So I want to make sure I, I spread my time correctly. So did you have any sleepless nights when you were going through the process? I mean, cause I, I'm always interested on yeah. the backside because you I did feel I, pretty bad. Yeah, no, I felt horrible, but I, you know, I told myself, look, like this is a volunteer organization. I'm again, I, I, don't think I left them high and dry. Oh, no, 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 no. I don't think was you did. Somebody, oh, no, you're not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but I just, I, I was like, no, this is, this is an opportunity for me. So, yeah. Well, I, I like how you're taking it because most of the times when I would have that conversation with someone in regards to not doing X, they would go into some kind of deep story. You're just... No, I made the decision I'm, and I'm content with my decision. That's right. Good. Because I, <laughs> cause I always hate when people go through that whole, what if, what if, what if. Don't go. Yeah. What if trains? Oof. I've had too long <laughs> in my life. Mm, I'm good now. I'm too old for that. So. <laughs> so I mean, so then through the process, if you don't mind me talking to your personal life, you get married around the same time. Oh, so yeah, there was so much. Mm-hmm. That was, you know what? I didn't even think of that. That was a whole other factor. I was engaged. I was going to get married that year. Plus I knew safety 2020 was coming. So Mm -hmm. I was like, look, I'm just not going to be able to give it the time it deserves. So, but yeah, yeah. No, I found my prince charming. (laughs) (laughs) No, I mean, and that's the great aspect because you're, you're taking a look at it, the whole aspect of the career, because you're not just looking at one thing of this could drive me to one thing. You're looking at it, how the whole aspect occurs. So now you get into construction how do you feel about the love towards construction? Some people love it. Some people hate it. I mean, and it's a combination of both because the heat does suck, especially being here in Central Florida. Yeah, it's a little, it was a little tough. So I, um, there was a couple things that happened in my life during that time. I got married, all sorts of stuff. I love that I can point at structures now in a construction site and I actually know what it is. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> but um, I also got diagnosed with a pretty rare disease during that time and the medication that I need to uh, uh, 
for the rest of my life now, I, it was giving me migraines. So I was just incredibly ill. Again, that was another, I'm not providing value. So I politely asked to kind of bow out. I said, look, this isn't the right fit for me. I actually took a step down. So, uh, cause that was a promotion for me. So, mm-hmm. but I said, look, my health and wellness, Ooh, I got to figure this out. And yeah. And so can we talk about that a little okay. bit? Because you, you, you had mentioned it prior to us talking. I, you know, like I always tell people, I don't like to know anything ahead of time because I don't want it to be one of those things that it's like a preloaded question. <laughs> no, because I, I'm, I'm really curious because you were referencing something earlier about plasma. So can we talk a little bit about what, what was yeah. going on at the time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's kind of an invisible illness. So I'm happy to talk it with anybody. I think when I first got diagnosed, I was not that okay talking about it like why is this happening to me but um in a nutshell there's a large part of my immune system that it just doesn't exist so um if you've heard of bubble boy before a long time Mm -hmm. it's not that severe but it's on that spectrum so it is a primary immunodeficiency called common variable immunodeficiency cvid i was going to say there has to be an abbreviation so, (laughs) so it is not autoimmune it is physically my immune system is broken so um let's say i go get a vaccine so my body will take it and kind of do some stuff with it but it won't remember what that um ailment or that pathogen is that i'm being vaccinated with so and that is true for anything in, in my life. So any cold I've had, I can catch the same cold again because I don't have the immunoglobulins, immunoglobulin G, A, or M in my body. It, it doesn't remember. So, you know, she kind of has Dory system or like, she's like Dory, like, what? Oh, everything's fine. She's amnesia. So what I do is I infuse myself with um, donated plasma immunoglobulin. So if you've ever donated plasma, I know a lot of people just do it and it's almost a little taboo because people do it like, oh, I need to do it to like, you know, eat some ramen as a college student, right? Mm-hmm. But uh, so it really saves lives. My life depends on it. I mean, in my, my quality of life has been so much better since I've been diagnosed and since um, I, I, I have the treatment. So uh, so sorry, let me back up. So if you've donated plasma, what they do is they take it, they clean it. There's all sorts of stuff that you donate when you donate plasma. But a large a part of it is immunoglobulins, which is your memory cells. So if you donated plasma and you had the flu shots, I would then have the memory cells of a flu shot. So, oh, and everything else too, like, uh, you know, the, whatever, the TB or tuberculosis or anything, mm-hmm. anything you've been exposed to before. So I would then um, gain your immunity. So thanks. <laughs> so so, let's so talk- that's why I'm really passionate about public health. Please, you're healthy, I'm healthy. That's the big circle here. <laughs> well, no, it's a very important thing. So is the trigger when you first find this out, then your migraine. So do you go, do you go to get tested because you're getting these migraines and you're not understanding why? So actually it's I, the, the medication was giving migraines okay. at first, but um, so it was about 10 years ago. Actually, when I first started my career, I got diagnosed with autoimmune hemolytic anemia. That is an autoimmune disease. Um, it has something to do with your memory cells again, where your own immune system was attacking my, my red blood cells. So I was very anemic. Long story, got better, in remission, all good. But from that point on, about 10 years ago, I just never got better in as far as like catching colds. Like I was always that sick kid and I would use almost every one of my sick days. And I remember some of my leaders looking at me like, what is wrong with you? I, okay, this is, this sounds horrible. I got pink eye three times in one year. And I was like, what is wrong with me? And I was working with the public. So I was like, maybe with all the kids or something. Like I, I thought I washed my hands enough. Turns out wasn't my fault. It's just my body doesn't, yeah, doesn't have any system. So it took 10 years to get diagnosed. And then um, after taking, I, it just got progressively worse. It was the year before I got married. I think I was on 13 antibiotics in one year. I had my doctor on speed dial. Like just, hey, I need help. Like I need another antibiotic. Let's, go, let's do this again. And I just blamed on my allergies the whole time. Um, it was mostly upper respiratory. It wasn't anything like MRSA, thank God. Mm-hmm. A lot of people who have this um, get very, very ill, unfortunately. So, But, yeah, so I, I, I started taking the medication, which is, it's not medication, it's plasma therapy. So, like, I, I you know, have to infuse it at home. There's a, there's a pump involved. It takes some time out of my day. But, again, it's a gift. It's scary because it's a blood product. So we are raised to know that bloodborne pathogens are scary, right? Ooh, don't touch mm-hmm. those. So, but it took a little bit of a journey to figure out that 
this is a gift. Obviously, it's clean by the manufacturer and it's all safe and regulated by the FDA. And now I'm to the other side where it's a gift. And if I can talk to anybody about what the disease is, because I'm sure it goes undiagnosed quite a bit. It's pretty rare. It's one out of 50,000. So there's not that many people who have it, but there's still some. And now I actually partner with the manufacturer and I even talk to doctors about my experience with it and other people who are newly diagnosed. So the manufacturer has like a little voice to voice program where people will call me and, you know, it's usually when they're first diagnosed, like just scared out of their wits. And so was I, and I offer, I know a lot of obviously not allowed to offer medical advice, but I can say, I know how you feel. This sucks. It's okay to say it sucks. And then we just kind of move forward and everyone finds their own path. This is The Jay Allen Show. We all want to make sure that our family is protected in medical emergencies. What many of us don't realize is that health insurance won't always cover the full amount of an emergency medical flight. Even with comprehensive coverage, you could get hit with high deductibles and co-pays. That's why an Air MedCare Network membership is so important. As a member... If an emergency arises, you won't see a bill for air medical transport when flown by an AMCN provider. Best of all, a membership covers your entire household for as little as $85 a year. AMCN providers are called upon to transport nearly 100,000 patients a year. This is coverage no family should go without. Now, as a Jay Allen Show listener, you'll get up to a $50 e-gift card with a new membership. Simply visit airmedcarenetwork.com slash safety and use the offer code safety. And don't forget to tell them that Jay Allen sent you. And we are back on the Jay Allen Show on Safety FM. So when you're first going through this process and everything is going on, I would imagine the level of being scared is extremely high. Are you doing the web the WebMD search, the Google searches? You're all of a sudden, your your doctor, yeah. you're looking at all this stuff. What's going through the mind at the so time? So I learned with the diagnosis of the hemolytic anemia. Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I can tell you, I did do a little bit, but there's just not a lot of information out there on this. Um, it's a disease, but again, it's it's something I probably inherited in my genes and then had some type of environmental stressor. It's nothing I did. It's not my fault. It's not anybody else's fault. So my dad took it pretty bad because he's like, oh, you know, my poor genes gave it to you. I'm like, relax. I'm still here. Modern medical science. I'm, I, I work a full-time career. Yeah, I kind of had to take a step down because I had to figure out how to manage that. But now I'm like right as rain. So... <laughs> so, for, so frequency of the plasma, how often do you have to do this? Um, so the meds, And if I'm getting way too personal, you can go ahead and say, Jay, no, shut up. And <laughs> no, 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 no. Hey, I'm happy to talk about it because I think people who donate plasma, I also volunteer at plasma centers and I shake their hand like, thank you so much. Thank you. I feel better. And I show my picture of my dog and my family. Oh my God, it's okay. So uh, any, anyone that I can help understand that it's it's pretty important in plasma donations. They do all sorts of other stuff to chemo, um, chemo hemophilia, all sorts of stuff. But um, yeah, so the I do it once a week. It takes me about two plus hours to do it. So there's a large syringe involved. It's not intramuscular, so it's not like a vaccine, like a shot. It's subcutaneous. So there's teeny little needles and I there's a little subset, you know, sub, sub-Q set that I set myself up with and I just park it on the, the bed and just hang out there for a little while. So mm-hmm. it's not too bad. It is a gift. I feel better. And then it's it's been about two years since I've been using the, the, uh, the plasma therapy or whatever, and I feel so much better. Mm-hmm. So. <laughs> so when you first make that first connection with the doctor, they tell you exactly what's going on and you find the, you find the peer group. Oh, okay, yeah. How does that first conversation go? Because all of a sudden somebody's sharing something with you that you're not familiar with. The doctor knows somewhat about, of course, but they're saying, hey, we're recommending this. Yeah. Tell, so me, tell me about the experience. I have like, so there's a couple different, uh, so I talk to doctors one-on-one and it could be uh, like, I, it could be folks in California. It could be throughout the country, right? So, um, or I can talk to patients one-on-one. Uh, again, I am not a medical professional. I just tell them my experience per FDA regulations. <laughs> So, and of course, I just don't want to mess anybody up. But um, yeah, when I was first diagnosed, the doctor was horrendous. So they just, it was a life-changing moment for me. And um, it was pretty scary. And he quietly walked into the room. Again, I thought this was all my allergies. So I went to an allergist and they tested me for everything. They're like, oh, you're not allergic to anything. But uh, keep taking your Zyrtec. Good luck. So I'm like, okay, 
right? So I got sick again, like two weeks later. I'm like, I pointed to my puffy face and I was like, this is what keeps happening. Come on, I'm not crazy. And they're like, oh, yeah, you, you don't look good. So they did a <laughs> bunch of labs. And so um, I was not that person that had to keep going to doctors to say something is wrong with me. But uh, luckily, so it's diagnosed relatively quickly once I figured out something wasn't right there. And uh, yeah, so he, the, the doctor who diagnosed me um, came in through basically a brochure of a nonprofit organization who supports folks with primary immunodeficiencies like the one I have, threw it on the gurney and said, hey, I'm diagnosing you with this chronic condition. Uh, you need to have this medication um, as soon as possible. You may die. You, um, if you don't take this, you may die. Blah blah blah. And I was like, also very personal. Very, it's a lot, sounds like a great, great approach. Read the brochure. Yeah, yeah. He literally said, "Google your disease. I want you to go, and I want you to look at this." And now that that nonprofit organization does do a really good job. They make all the information really palatable to just the public and such. It was really easy for me to be able to talk about it. But I was in shock. So and then he like literally was circling the the, the uh, patient room and was about to leave. He was like, no, no, no. Like, <laughs> help me get my arms around this. Like, it, does this affect if I can have a family? Does this, I mean, I was 31 at the time. So I was like, what's, I just got married four months before. So uh, this, this guilt of uh, the, the burden that I was going to put this chronic illness on me and my new husband, it was horrible. And then I also grieved the life I thought I was going to have, like, I thought I was getting ooh, just married is happily ever after everything's going right. And then in an instant, I felt like everything changed. So I did reach out to a therapist through my employer assistance program. Like it's the free ones or something. And it really helped. So, yeah, I mean, I know there's a bit of a taboo for some folks reaching out to a therapist, but if you need help, go for it. So I did. And we talked about it. And I think within four sessions, we ran out of things to talk about so <laughs> so when you when you look at that now is that something that you would recommend if somebody was actually coming up with a disease that all of a sudden they have that would, yeah. you, would that be the first thing that you would tell them to do yeah 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 so if they i think what i didn't understand was i was feeling the, the sense of grief that i didn't i didn't I was like why am i so sad and obviously it was scared it took a little while for the insurance to clear the meds the meds are incredible so and I'm you don't have to whisper, you should say that louder. So <laughs> oh my God. I think it's something around six thousand dollars a month or something without insurance. That's a list mm -hmm. price. So obviously there's copay assistance programs and all sorts of mm -hmm. interesting things that I can do. But uh yeah, so that was incredibly scary. But yeah, no, I think a lot of people are afraid to reach out to a therapist. I, no my my parents have never like taught us to like talk about our feelings or anything like that. But it was good to just be able to articulate what was bothering me. And once I was able to identify that, then I was able to just kind of like, all right, here's what I'm going to do moving forward. It's going to be better. And then that zero to hero moment was about six months after I started to go therapy. And then I saw on a sheet of paper that the immune system parts that they were looking for skyrocketed and it was back where it was supposed to be. And then another six months path and I realized, oh my gosh, I haven't even been on an antibiotic this whole year. So it was amazing. <laughs> so, so what's the experience relationship wise at the time? So you're going through this, you and your husband are going through this journey together. I mean, you're just yeah. married, you find this out. Oh, and, and I would imagine he's your support system. How, how is, how is the interaction? It's then? just the sweetness. Yeah. So my husband, um, I love him very much. Um, he actually works with, not with me, but he works at the same place. And a lot of folks know him as being very salty <laughs> and he can be very like, he, he's a vet. So not, not a veterinary. <laughs> he's, he's, he was, you know, he went, he was deployed and all sorts of stuff like that. So he knows how to, he's like, just, you got to keep marching forward. It's going to be okay. Just keep moving forward. So he definitely, I know a lot of people say, you're my rock, but he definitely was a huge piece of support for me. So it was great. So yeah. it, as he, as he's looking through this, I mean, I would imagine he's going through the same, a lot of the emotional experiences at the time. I mean, it's new. You're not sure what's going to happen. And he, I'm, I would and the assumption he doesn't know what's going to happen either. Oh, yeah. Is I think there... We both were scared. There was a night where we both kind of like a little bit. We both shed a couple of tears. Are and... you supposed to admit that about him? No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, <laughs> he has feelings. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, there was there was that feeling, and um, but then you know what? It was like, but and it wasn't a pull yourself off your own bootstraps and get up and keep going. It was like let's just keep marching forward step by step and he understood that it was a little bit of my journey i had to go through these feelings and stuff so he um was cool calm collected and that's all i could ask for so 
Yeah, it's really sweet. <laughs> it is. It is sweet. It's really sweet. <laughs> so as you, as you're looking at this, and now you know how to control it to an extent with the plasma and so on, and you're able to assist other people. Do you get strength from hearing from other people's stories? Oh my gosh, yes. So another huge turning point in my um, and I, I feel bad. I feel like all we're talking about is my disease, oh, no, no, no. But, but, but this is true. Like I want it's other people the, to realize it's, it's part of the journey and it's part of your career. Yeah. And, and here's here's what I like to talk about, and I like talking about safety, but I also like to talk about the reality of things that happen behind the scenes. And I think that sometimes people don't want to have those conversations because we have to portray this image of X up, 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 opposed to it being this is really what happened. This yeah. is the conversation that the husband and I had. Well, and this These is why I'm concerns. so invested in public health because if you're healthy, I'm healthy, like <laughs> literally. So, you know, it's important for, for, I mean, it was always important for me to help other people, but now it's very important. So yeah, no, um, there was part of the patient program series that I'm a part of now. There was someone who was my age and he was happy and healthy. And he like shared at like a program that was, there was a healthcare provider to talk about the meds. I was already on the meds, but then he was there talking and he was happy, healthy. And he's like, look, you know, it sucks, but you get through it and it's not that big of a deal. And then I think what also kind of was a click in my mind is I have a cousin. She's like 12. Now. I love her. She's adorable. But when she was five years old, she had diagnosed with diabetes. So uh, the juvenile kind, right? And she had to put a bunch of needles in her. So she was five years old. So I'm like, if she can do that, I can do this. So a little scary. But, but here's, here's the important part about what you're saying as well, is that you can still have a normal life. I mean, there is one time a week, two and a half hours, based on what you're saying, that things are a little bit different. Mm-hmm. But as you're looking at this, I mean, it's not like it's, it's changed your life, but it's not changed your life, if that makes sense. I think it's changed it. I'm not going to say for the better, because, I mean, I, I do feel better, and it kind of sucks. I have a, a chronic illness, and it is an invisible illness. If you saw me walking on the street, I don't think you would think there's anything wrong with me. So, But I have a compassion for others now. I think I've always had some compassionate care, but now I truly like, all right, maybe that person's going through something, or maybe there's something in their life that they, they can't share with me. And I understand people are on journeys of all different kinds. Yeah, so... I mean, and it's been a, a, a relatively different journey. I mean, your your journey is much different than a lot of people that I get to speak to. So as you're looking at this now and you're going back into your career and you're, you're going back to studying and you're going through this and you're going through some other aspects of, of what's going on with your employer, what are you looking to do next? Oh, Lord. so, okay. So I'm currently furloughed from the, my place of employment and my place of employment is a multi-billion dollar entertainment company in central Florida. Um, uh, you know, it has given me so much. It's given me a career. I found my gold in there, like, and it has given a lot of joy, just to say, to lots of families throughout the world. That's not part of their benefit packages. It does not come with a spouse, <laughs> just in case. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Well, there are a lot of folks that find their, their significant others there. It's, it's crazy. So, but um, we'll see. I'm currently on furlough. I've been on furlough since April 2020. Um, I have to prepare both ways. So I'm not sure if they're going to call me back or if they are. What I can tell you is right now, I am in that, that USF, that master's program, and I have a scholarship. It's essentially a full ride. So, I mean, it is a full ride. They pay for everything, and it's, like, amazing. So if I would have known about this about 10 years ago, I would have knocked it out. It's not easy. and It is not for the faint of heart. But if if anybody is interested, maybe I can give you a link to where. Oh, pl- oh please. Um, and you can put the show notes mm-hmm. or something. But, like, I wish somebody would have told me I'm one of two people in the class. So, and I... I don't know what the actual stats are. I think it's um, they can take up to ten people, but it's fully funded by NIOSH. Mm-hmm. They, the you know, the government wants us to help public health in whatever that looks like. There's all different kinds of scholarships they have there, but it is part of the um, education and research center. So some universities participate and some don't. I am part of the Sunshine Education Research Center. Again, I'm going to send you the link okay. of what that looks like and stuff. But yeah. how did how did you find it? Oh my gosh! Again like just fell into it. So um, someone who I work for, her daughter and a coworker of mine went through the program. And I was like, wow, that's great. I really wish I, you know, could do that and whatever. But again, I have some student loans that I definitely didn't want to tack on any more student loans to that, uh, to what I I currently have. And um, they were kind of coy about like, I don't know why they were coy about like how much the the costs were and stuff, because you do have to apply. You do have to meet some credentials and stuff, but essentially the, the, the folks there urged me to like, just drive over there and go talk to the guy. That's literally what I did. So I just during 
during work one day, I had a reason to go over there. I had to drop off a piece of industrial hygienic equipment that we were donating to them. But while I was there, I made sure to speak to the program advisor and said, hey, I would like to do this. This is great. And essentially, that's, yeah, there you go. So so after the master's, are you going for the doctorate? Oh, man. I mean, I'm not as cool as you. I don't, <laughs> I'm not that cool. I don't know. We'll see. I don't know. I mean, this really is, I think my undergrad, and maybe you, you can also agree with this too, like my undergrad, I just did the classes to knock it out, and I just wanted to get out and start working as soon as possible. Now my graduate studies I'm picking and choosing what classes I want. And maybe because I'm older too, like this semester, I'm like, I'm taking a self-paced course study Mm -hmm. and where I'm going to a bunch of webinars and like, and you can do that. If you talk to your advisor and you say, Hey, this is what benefit it's going to bring me. And I'm going to provide a justification and blah, blah, blah. You can do that. So it's great to see that I'm developing myself and I do need to prepare. I'm not sure if my employer will call me back before or after the summer, but during the summer in my program, I do need to get some field experience is what they call it. So um, I am looking for internships. If you know any good ones, let me know. <laughs> a lot of them are closed because of COVID this year. So, but I'm, I'm willing to travel and I, but I can really stretch the bounds of all over the place. So I, I'm looking into insurance or um, I, I was like, maybe something at the CDC or something like that. Like, how can I expand my but this is the first time I feel like I'm able to groom myself and I'm able to make mistakes. Uh-oh, did you just say that out loud? Oh, my God, it feels so good. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't feel like I'm under incredible pressure to do the – I mean, I, I try to do the best thing, you know, the right thing every time. But uh, if I make a mistake, oh, I'm a student. I'm allowed to do that. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, darn. So here, here's I'm not as hard on myself, I guess. Well, you, you shouldn't be. Here's an interesting question for you. <clears throat> Would you be willing to actually go into the public sector and have conversations with people having this discussion? I know you're saying that you've done it in a peer group in regards to what's going on with you medically, but letting people know on how they can still have a career. Oh, yeah. Regard- no, please. Oh, that is something oh, no, no, else. I just want to make sure. I just oh, want to make no, sure. No, no, no. I'm sorry. No, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm speaking to the microphone. I'm like, yes, please. No, like, like if if I can do it, like, I just always say, I'm just a lowly safety professional is what I like to say. Like, And, and that's there's nothing lowly about it. But um, but I'm just like a common Joe Schmo, but um, I just keep going for it. And then like just like this scholarship opportunity, all I had to do was ask and it happened. And then like you just I, I there's so many times in my career that I've learned that all you have to do is just kind of raise your hand and say, hey, well, well can, can I can I join? Can I have some fun over there, too? And maybe that's a whole other separate discussion, because okay. I think that sometimes people don't realize that. I oh, don't, OK. In regards of. Sometimes all you really have to do. Perhaps I'm rambling. Back no, 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 you're not, okay. no, 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 you're not rambling. But it's sometimes people tend to forget that is that if you don't ask the question to do X, you don't know that X is available. Oh, my gosh. I know. Yeah. Like, it's like, come on. So, like, I always, uh, I don't know. I've never been quiet. I've never. But and I've also, I would have never gathered that. <laughs> and I've never had a problem picking up the phone and calling somebody. And I think, like, a lot of folks, like, have, like, oh, maybe I should just email them first. Or blah, 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 blah. No. Let's just pick up the phone and call. Hello. How's it going? How's it? I need help. Like, if you just say, hey, I need some help, usually people are like, okay, especially in our career, because people are out there to help other folks. So I've had many mentors that way. And I, do, I don't necessarily have one person I look up to. I have a bunch of different mentors. And I'm like, mm, I like this piece out of you, but I don't like that piece out of you. And don't do that or do this. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyways, so as a you lot say, of help. So as you say, a lot of mentors, who comes to mind when you, when you use that term? I mean, um, just a lot of interesting coworkers that I have. And in, in, I think the way that my business is set up, we, Safety, are a separate organization, but I'm like a dotted line to whichever line of business or executive that I'm supporting at the time. So sometimes it's not even folks in the safety organization. It's someone working on the front lines. It's somebody who is in the engineering field and that I get to just kind of see what they do on their side. I get to kind of like peek over the fence. But yeah, I would say lots of folks. I can't put my finger on one, but there's lots of pretty cool people out there. So I'm going to ask you a strange, a strange question book that you would recommend for people to read that want to get into this career? Oh, geez. A book. Oh, my God. You can say audio book. It's perfectly fine. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, How about um, Driven to Distraction? <laughs> I don't know if ever, no, I mean, obviously, there's all these great books out there and such like I mean, that. Only if one comes to mind, you're, no force here at my, all. My brain is completely uh, a mess right now, but um, I like I 
Yeah, one, I'm sorry, one does not come to mind. Okay, so. that's perfectly fine. So if people want to know more about you and what's going on, where can they contact you? Oh, um, I mean, like, I have a Facebook page. You know, I'm not, I'm not that pop. My dog has a really cool <laughs> Facebook page. <laughs> Boomer the Aussie <laughs> pup. <laughs> Very handsome. You play around in LinkedIn quite a bit? In, I'm sorry? In LinkedIn, do you mess around in LinkedIn? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm on LinkedIn, too. That's okay. right. So yeah. that's what we'll do. We'll put LinkedIn on, on the show notes for people to be, be able to reach out to you if you're cool with that. Well, I appreciate you coming on to the show today. The views and opinions expressed on this podcast are those of the host and its guest and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the company. Examples of analysis discussed within this podcast are only examples. They should not be utilized in the real world as the only solution available as they are based only on very limited and dated open source information. Assumptions made within this analysis are not reflective of the position of the company. No part of this podcast may be reproduced, stored in a retrieval system, or transmitted in any any form or by any means, mechanical, electronic, recording, or otherwise, without prior written permission of the creator of the podcast, Jay Allen. Want more of the Jay Allen Show? Go to safetyfm.com. Are you tired of not being able to reach the people inside of your organization? What if there's a better approach? What if you could contact them in a click of a button? Here at Safety FM, we can assist you reach your team via podcast. How about setting up a private podcast for just you and your team members? We will cover topics that are important to you and your company. Visit safetyfm.com. That's safetyfm.com. And click on services for more information about your own private podcast. Safety FM, a safety-focused moment venture.